Saudi Arabia just turned one of the driest places on earth into a garden. With seawater. Yeah. You read that right. Scientists expected failure. Maybe some salt-crusted sand. Definitely not what actually happened. So what grew in that desert? Keep watching and find out. The Arabian desert isn't exactly known for its lush vegetation. It's known for sand, heat, and approximately 0% humidity. For reference, Death Valley gets more rain. The average annual rainfall in Saudi Arabia's empty quarter, about 3 inches. That's less moisture than a well-done chicken breast. But here's the thing about Saudi Arabia. They've built a reputation for doing the impossible with terrible ideas that somehow work. Indoor ski slopes in 120-degree heat? Check. A city in the desert with no carbon emissions? In progress. A line-shaped city 100 miles long? Also in progress. And yes, that's real. So when Saudi scientists announced they were going to pump seawater into the desert to grow crops, the international community had one collective response. Sure, Jan. Because here's the problem. Seawater is salty. Like, really salty. Ocean water contains about 35 grams of salt per liter. That's roughly the same salinity as your tears after watching your favorite character die in a TV show. And plants? Plants hate salt. It dehydrates them, messes with their cellular processes, and generally makes their lives miserable. Traditional agriculture requires fresh water, the kind that falls from the sky or flows in rivers. Saudi Arabia has neither in abundance, the country uses about 17 billion cubic meters of water annually. Agriculture alone accounts for roughly 80% of that. Renewable freshwater resources, about 2.4 billion cubic meters per year. The math isn't mathing. Saudi Arabia has been importing about 80% of its food. That's a lot of dependence on other countries for your basic survival needs. Not exactly ideal when you're trying to be a regional powerhouse. So they had options. Keep importing food forever, burn through their limited groundwater reserves, or get creative. They chose creative, with a side of absolutely bonkers. The King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, or COST, decided to tackle the problem head-on. The plan was simple in concept, nightmarish in execution. Take seawater from the Red Sea, pump it inland, use it to grow crops, without desalination. Let's pause here. Desalination is the process of removing salt from seawater to make it drinkable or usable for agriculture. It's expensive, energy intensive, and the reason your water bill in Saudi Arabia could fund a small yacht. The kingdom already operates some of the largest desalination plants in the world, producing about 5.6 million cubic meters of fresh water daily. But desalination for agriculture? At scale, the costs would be astronomical. We're talking GDP denting expensive. So the scientists asked a different question. What if we didn't remove the salt? What if we just found plants that could handle it? Enter halophytes. These are plants that thrive in salty conditions. They've evolved mechanisms to either exclude salt, secrete it, or store it in specific cells away from vital processes. They grow in salt marshes, coastal areas, and other places where normal plants would shrivel up and die. The most common halophyte, most people know. Mangroves. Those weird trees with roots that stick up out of the water like they're drowning and trying to breathe. Mangroves can grow in seawater. They filter out about 90% of the salt at their roots. And they excrete the rest through their leaves. But mangroves aren't exactly a food crop. You can't make a salad out of mangrove leaves. So the Saudi team started experimenting with other halophytes. Specifically a plant called salicornia. Salicornia is a succulent that looks like tiny green fingers sticking out of the ground. It's also known as sea asparagus, pickleweed, or samphire, depending on where you are in the world. And it grows in salt marshes across Europe, North America, and Asia. Here's what makes salicornia interesting. It's edible. It's nutritious. It's crunchy and tastes like salty asparagus, which makes sense given one of its nicknames. High-end restaurants have been serving it for years as a gourmet vegetable. More importantly, Silicornia can tolerate salt concentrations that would murder a tomato plant in minutes. It can grow in soil with salinity levels up to 3%. Seawater is about 3.5%. Close enough. The scientists at Cow SD started small. Test plots. Controlled conditions. They pumped seawater from the Red Sea to inland farms and planted salicornia. 
Then they waited to see if anything would happen besides creating the world's most expensive salt flat. And something did happen. The salicornia grew, not just survived, thrived. The plants shot up like they were on a botanical espresso drip. Growth rates exceeded expectations. The scientists were baffled. They ran the numbers again, still baffled. But here's where it gets weird. The salicornia wasn't the only thing growing. The soil itself started changing. See, when you irrigate desert sand with seawater, you'd expect salt buildup, salt crusts, a white layer of crystallized sodium chloride that turns the ground into a mineral skating rink. That didn't happen. Or rather, it didn't happen the way they expected. The salicornia was absorbing the salt. But more than that, it was processing it, storing it in its tissues, and preventing the kind of salt accumulation that would normally sterilize the soil. The plants were acting as biological salt filters. When the salicornia died back or was harvested, it left behind organic matter. In a desert, organic matter is the foundation of soil health. It retains water, supports microorganisms, and creates the conditions for more complex plant life. The team started seeing something nobody predicted. The areas around the salicornia plots showed signs of increased microbial activity, tiny organisms that break down organic matter and fix nitrogen, the kind of biological processes that happen in healthy soil ecosystems, not barren desert sand. This was the shocking part. They were building soil in one of the most inhospitable environments on Earth with seawater. Now, salicornia is great, but you can't feed a nation on sea asparagus alone. So the scientists started experimenting with other halophytes. Regular quinoa is already pretty salt tolerant compared to other grains. But there are varieties that can handle even higher salinity levels. They tested a strain called Titicae quinoa, which grows naturally around the high altitude salt flats of Bolivia and Peru. This stuff can tolerate irrigation water with salt concentrations around 40 millimoles per liter. That's about half the salinity of seawater. The solution? Dilute the seawater. Mix it with the limited fresh water available, or use it in ratios that bring the salinity down to levels the quinoa can handle. Suddenly, you're stretching your freshwater supply while still growing food. The quinoa trials worked. Not as spectacularly as the salicornia, but well enough to be viable. The plants produced grain, edible, nutritious grain that could be turned into flour, cooked like rice, or sold to trendy health food stores at premium prices. Then came the mangroves, because if you're already pumping seawater into the desert, why not go full mad scientist? Mangrove forests are some of the most productive ecosystems on the planet. They sequester carbon like it's their job because it literally is. They provide habitat for fish, protect coastlines from erosion, and filter pollutants from water. They're basically nature's overachievers. The Saudi team planted mangrove seedlings in inland areas irrigated with seawater. This sounds insane. Mangroves grow on coasts. The brackish water mixing. The specific conditions of coastal environments. Except they don't, apparently. The mangroves grew. Then faster as they established root systems. There were actual mangrove trees growing in the middle of the desert. Dozens of miles from the coast. The environmental implications started stacking up. Mangroves are carbon sinks. Saudi Arabia's carbon emissions? About 600 million tons annually. Every little bit of sequestration helps. Plus, the mangrove forests created microclimates. Shade. Slightly higher humidity. Cooler temperatures. Not planted by humans. Opportunistic species that found the conditions around the mangroves just tolerable enough to take root. Seeds blown in by wind or carried by birds found purchase in the slightly less hostile environment created by the seawater irrigation and the plants it supported. This is called facilitation in ecology. One species modifies the environment in ways that make it easier for other species to survive. It's how ecosystems develop. And it was happening in the Saudi desert, powered by seawater. But let's talk economics, because growing food is one thing. Growing it profitably is another. Salicornia has market value. It's sold fresh in European markets for about 15 to 20 euros per kilogram. It's also being explored as a biofuel crop. Salicornia produces oil-rich seeds that can be pressed for biodiesel. The oil yield is comparable to soybeans, but with the advantage of not needing fresh water or arable land. A company called Seawater Farms has been cultivating salicornia in Eritrea 
using a similar seawater irrigation model. They're producing both the vegetable for food markets and seed oil for fuel. The numbers suggest it's viable at commercial scale. Saudi Arabia looked at these numbers and saw opportunity. They scaled up. Experimental farms expanded from test plots to hundreds of hectares. The government started offering incentives for private companies to invest in halophyte agriculture. By 2020, Saudi Arabia had operational salicornia farms producing thousands of tons annually. Some of it went to local markets. Most was exported to Europe and Asia, where the gourmet vegetable market was growing. The quinoa production added another revenue stream. Full quinoa prices have been climbing for years thanks to health food trends and increased global demand. Saudi-grown quinoa, marketed as sustainably produced using innovative water management, commanded premium prices. Then there's the mangrove timber, resistant to rot and valuable for construction. It takes decades to grow a harvestable mangrove tree. So this is a long-term investment. But long-term thinking is what you do when you're sitting on oil reserves that won't last forever. The infrastructure required for all this wasn't cheap. Pipelines from the Red Sea coast to inland farms, pumping stations, storage facilities, distribution networks. The initial investment ran into billions of dollars, but Saudi Arabia has billions of dollars. What they don't have is water security or food security. The seawater agriculture program addresses both. There's also the political angle. Saudi Arabia's Vision 2030 plan aims to diversify the economy away from oil dependence. Agriculture fits that goal. So does the environmental brownie points from carbon sequestration through mangrove forests. Now, this all sounds great, but let's address the elephant in the desert. What about the environmental impact of pumping massive amounts of seawater inland? Taking water from the ocean and moving it to the desert isn't without consequences. You're altering local ecosystems. You're using energy to run the pumps. You're potentially affecting marine life near the intake points. The intake systems use screens and filters to prevent fish and other organisms from being sucked into the pipes. The water extraction rates are carefully managed to avoid creating significant changes in local ocean conditions. The energy consumption is real, but Saudi Arabia has abundant solar potential. Many of the pumping stations are being retrofitted with solar panels. It's not perfect but it's moving in the right direction. As for the inland environmental impact, the evidence so far suggests it's actually positive. The introduction of plant life and organic matter to barren desert isn't destroying an existing ecosystem. It's creating one where none existed. There are concerns about what happens if the program is abandoned. Would the salt accumulate over time? Would the soil become too saline to support even halophytes? Long-term studies are ongoing. But the early data suggests that as long as there's active management and crop rotation, the system is sustainable. Other countries are paying attention. The United Arab Emirates has started similar programs. Egypt is exploring seawater agriculture in the Sinai Peninsula, like Australia and Peru, are looking at halophyte cultivation. As climate change increases desertification and fresh water becomes scarcer, the ability to grow crops with seawater could be transformative. Current estimates suggest there are about 900 million hectares of salt-affected land globally. That's land that's too salty for conventional agriculture, but potentially suitable for halophyte cultivation. If even a fraction of that land could be brought into production using seawater irrigation, it could add significantly to global food supplies. The technology is also being adapted for other applications. Researchers are exploring using salicornia as animal feed. The plant has high protein content and grows quickly. Livestock trials have shown positive results with sheep and cattle. There's also interest in using halophyte cultivation for bioremediation. Salt-damaged agricultural land could potentially be rehabilitated by growing salicornia for several seasons, allowing the plants to extract excess salt before returning the land to conventional crops. The pharmaceutical industry is getting involved too. Some halophytes produce unique compounds as part of their salt tolerance mechanisms. These compounds have potential medical applications from anti-inflammatory drugs to treatments for hypertension. Saudi Arabia's desert experiment has opened doors nobody knew existed. The country that's famous for oil might become famous for solving agricultural challenges in the most unlikely way possible. The original question was whether you could pump seawater into the desert and grow anything. The answer turned out to be yes, but the real discovery was everything that came after. The soil development, the ecosystem creation, the carbon sequestration, 
The economic viability. Scientists expected salt and sand. They got a blueprint for turning wastelands into productive agricultural systems. Not bad for what started as a crazy idea from a desert kingdom with more money than water. The future of farming might not look like rolling fields of wheat in Iowa. It might look like Salicornia farms in the Arabian desert, irrigated with seawater, thriving in conditions that would kill traditional crops, and proving that sometimes the most unlikely solutions are the ones that work. Thanks for watching. If you want to see more videos like this, hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. It actually helps more than you'd think. See you next time.